I'm now going to introduce uh, Tom Brookmans from the University of Southampton, who um, has been working for some time now in the area of network analysis, so bringing this um, establishing network theory and network methods as a tool for investigating the past. And so, um, Tom, exploring visibility networks in Iron Age and Roman southern Spain with exponential random graph models. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you, everyone in Digital Classicist, for having me here. It's a real honor. Um, I heard that the Institute of Archaeology is actually, at the moment, unveiling a monolith uh, right in front of their institute. And it's a free event, and you get free wine and everything. So I'm really delighted that there's still people here who think that I'm more interesting than a monolith and free wine. Obviously, the free wine will follow. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, exploring visibility networks. and. Um, as Stuart said, I'm Tom, I'm an archaeologist, my entire background is in archaeology, I'm not a network scientist per se, I'm not uh, a, a, a classicist or anything, but I love networks. And I'm not the only one who loves networks, I don't know the people who are engaged with digital humanities communities might have noticed the word network or network science, network analysis, or graph theory kind of popping up left, right and center all the time in the last, coming, uh, last few years. And that's because network science is kind of a bit of a hot topic in a lot of disciplines, and archaeology is one of them. And there's a lot of people that are extremely enthusiastic, people like me, who love networks in archaeology. Uh, uh, but with that enthusiasm, sometimes uh, it tends to get a little bit blind, and we are not very much aware of the challenges that we are faced with, with doing networks in archaeology critically, doing it well, not only innovative, not just doing networks because we can, but doing networks because it allows us to answer questions that we haven't been able to answer before. Or because an approach like that allows us to raise new questions of the data that we've already had. So some of these questions, I mean, a number of archaeologists have been raising questions of, uh, you know, why, why are we doing networks in archaeology? And like absolutely everything in the universe, I think this can be usefully classified in these four categories, space, time, uh, stuff, and what we do with it. So a number of um, challenges to do with space um, some, some archaeologists say that it is uh, challenging to think about networks on multiple scales, even though it allows for us to uh, look at interactions on multiple scales. Network analysts have been focusing on a regional scale in archaeology. What about the local scale? What about interpersonal interactions? Uh, because of archaeological data, that's sometimes very difficult to, to, to deal with. So how do we do this? Um, also, process. When we're talking about networks, do we talk, I mean, this, okay, this is just an image, obviously. These are points and lines connecting those points. This could represent a network. What does this network actually mean? Is this a static representation of, for example, archaeological data? Or does, if we zoom into this network, are we actually looking at a dynamic past? What, let, let's imagine that we identify these nodes as, as sites, so representing communities in the past. And those communities are connected to each other. For example, this line represents a road between two past communities. Is this still a static representation of, of the past? Well, I don't think so, because we make assumptions of what this relationship actually means. This is a road between two past communities. What are roads used for? They're used for people or moving people or goods back and forth. And with those people come ideas. So we're talking explicitly here, because we make assumptions about what a network means, we're talking explicitly about dynamic processes, even though we represent them in a static way sometimes. So archaeologists tend to struggle with this when they're dealing with network techniques. And then there's um, other challenges linked more to um, how to use archaeological data within network, quantitative network techniques, and methodological challenges of um, network analysis itself not really being a very homogenous uh, tool of uh, quantitative techniques and having a very, uh, very diverse background, really. Um, I won't be dealing with these data and methodological issues. Instead, in this presentation, I'll try to focus on ways in which archaeologists can think creatively about space in terms of networks and how archaeologists might be able to contribute uh, to network science by doing something that they do a lot. Archaeologists like to look at visibility in the landscape. Why? Because it's one of those only things that we have. There is a landscape, we can look around it, we can draw lines on that landscape between places that we consider important. We can do that. Uh, network scientists haven't been doing that, so 
Let's try to focus on that. And on the other hand, I'll focus on process. I'll focus on uh, exactly what archaeologists should be focusing on, which is the dynamic behavior of people in the past. It's people's behavior and, and behavioral change. And uh, how network techniques that I haven't developed, but network scientists have been playing around with for at least three decades, um, uh, can, can help us think, make those assumptions that we make about uh, past community interaction explicit and talk about processes that might have happened in the past. Um, so if you're interested in people challenging networks, there's two publications here that you probably can't read. One of them is mine, and another one is Carl Nappett's book, uh, published in 2011, called An Archaeology of Interaction, within which he tries to marry a theoretical and a methodological approach to interactions in the past within one framework, and I can definitely recommend that book. It's pretty critical and interesting. So, this will be a methodological talk. I'll be, on the one hand, trying to talk about uh, visibility patterns, about analyzing uh, intervisibility networks. So one aim could be the changing interactions between urban settlements as reflected to patterns of intervisibility. That's what I'll be exploring. On the, on the other hand, because it's a methodological talk and because I want to contribute to the archaeologist toolbox of quantitative techniques, um, I'll suggest a method that allows us to bridge static and dynamic spatial network approaches. And I'll do that, as I said, through a case study on visibility networks. What is a visibility network? Well, you could represent it kind of like this. You have site A and site B. Both of them obviously represent past communities. They don't just represent stones. No, there's sites that we've identified and they meant something in the past. Um, just imagine that on site B there's an observer standing on any location in site B and the observer looks around the landscape and maybe the observer can see another site, another urban settlement somewhere. So uh, the observer on site A is connected to site B through a line of sight. In that case, we could create a network of something like this, where we represent site A and site B as individual nodes, and we draw arrows between site A and B, representing a line of sight. Simple. Um, we can add more information. That line of sight between the observer in site A and site B has a length. So we can add that as an attribute to that arrow. And we can also see whether an observer standing in site B can actually see site A. So we can explore whether this line of sight is reciprocated in some way. So that's the kind of networks I'm interested in and that I'll be discussing in this uh, case study. The study area of the case study is Roman southern Spain. And it's a beautiful place to do your research in because it's just great weather all year round. And in the summer, you just can't do any work because it's too hot. It's lovely and the food's great. But um, on an archaeological level, this is uh, the area of the, the Guadalquivir River Valley between uh, modern Seville, this ancient Hispalis, and, um, and Cordoba. Seville's located here. And in Cordoba, further up the river right there, uh, the main river you can see there, cutting through it, is the uh, Guadalquivir River, which was called the uh, River Baitis in the past. And um, you can see that in the north and in the south, this area, this big valley, is flanked by two mountain ranges, the Sierra Morena in the north and the Sistema Subetico in the south. Within that area, uh, there were a lot of sites. This was always a very densely urbanized area uh, since at least the Late Bronze Age, and especially th throughout the Iron Age. And in particular, the very uh, fertile area just south of the, uh, the Guadalquivir River called the Vega and Campina area. And you see all these little dots here with numbers. Those are all the sites I'll be talking about, not individually, but how they create bigger patterns on a regional level. Um, so we, uh, I say we, Simon Kay, <laughs> Professor Simon Kay of the University of Southampton and uh, Graham Merle and David Wheatley uh, had a project called the Urban Connectivity in Iron Age and Roman Southern Spain project. Uh, they went out in the, in, in the field, tried to identify new sites and also collected all available evidence on published sites in the area. And uh, that just led to a nice data set of 190 sites where we can say something about. There's more sites that we can say absolutely nothing about, so I, uh, I won't be addressing them. 190 sites. Uh, spatial distribution throughout the landscape that's really interesting vi um, visually because if you see like you know mountains in the north mountains in the south a massive relatively flat plain here and then you know increasing uh, hills as you go uh, upstream on the Guadalquivir river there's plenty of hills and foothills here kind of funneling visibility inwards here and then from here it's funneling visibility towards the Atlantic visibility 
in general in this area is pretty good. Now, especially if you're um, uh, standing on sites which are located on, on hilltops or on plateau sites. You, you generally have a very good vi uh, visibility of the entire area, of, of parts of the study area. So, why would I be interested in visibility in this landscape? Not just because we can see, but because I think it's important. And I'm not the only one. Um, Iron Age archaeologists of this region have considered uh, visibility as one of the factors for explaining site location in the area. Because a lot of these Iron Age sites, as you can see on this graph here, so the Iberian period is, uh, is the, Iron, the late Iron Age, and you can see the total number of sites there, and you can also see a uh, number of sites that are on, on, located on visually prominent uh, positions. Uh, there's a lot of them. A lot of them are actually located on visually prominent positions. Very often they're also associated with uh, defensive architecture, giving kind of, you know, adding more kudos to the, uh, to the interpretation that visibility might have been important. Why? Maybe for visually controlling the surrounding landscape and movement of people, for example, that could have clear military purposes. Another hypothesis that's often uh, mentioned is uh, the importance of visibility for communication purposes. So in terms of signaling networks, so if you have two, um, if you have two uh, urban communities, and they could send smoke or fire signals to each other, and that would only make sense if they could see, if they, if they could be intervisible from one another. So these hypotheses have been suggested by Iron Age specialists to explain uh, the site distribution pattern in the Iron Age. Roman archaeologists of this area have never really considered visibility as an important factor for explaining site location in the area. And on the one hand, that's totally understandable, because you can see that there's not a lot of newly founded uh, sites throughout time, which you can see right here. So the number of new sites being, uh, uh, being occupied throughout Roman times isn't, isn't dramatically uh, large. And also, they very often look at location of, uh, of these uh, urban communities, of these sites, on uh, transport networks, for example. The location of these sites on the Guadalquivir River Valley, which was navigable from uh, Seville and basically the Atlantic all the way to Cordoba, and then there was a, a, a secondary river called the Genil, which was navigable all the way to uh, Ethica, which is uh, ancient Aztecan. Um, so if a site is located on, on the river network, or maybe on the road network, on the Via Augusta, which uh, passed through Cordoba to Aztecan, Carmona, um, Hispalis, and then down to Cadiz, um, if sites are located on these, you could imagine that there might be a reason why. You know, maybe they're uh, strong, uh, better embedded within the wider socioeconomic structure of the Roman Empire as a whole. Um, on the other hand, a lot of these sites, especially in the early imperial and the Flavian period, um, uh, received a, a sort of urban status. They could be colonies or they could be municipia, for example. And there's several hypotheses of what that might actually mean. Some people say it's, it's a sort of hierarchy for urban communities in Roman times. But at the very least, it's some kind of administrative um, uh, denomination. Uh, so we could say that these sites might have been better embedded within the socio-political or administrative structure of the Roman Empire at large. So we don't need visibility to explain site location. We've got it all there. If they're close to the river and close to the roads, then uh, you know, that's why they're there. There's no other reason. Um, I would say that is a silly way to argue just because we've got a massive residue. We can see that there's a lot of sites that just continue in occupation throughout time. At the very least, we would expect these visibility patterns that we see in the Iron Age, which people consider to be important for explaining their site location, and possibly structuring interactions between past communities in the Iron Age, they just kind of persist. They're still there. There's a possibility, at the very least, that they continue on structuring interactions between communities in Roman times. So why don't we look at this? You know, there are other, it's, visibility isn't, isn't the entire story, but we don't have a lot of data. Well, actually, 190 sites is a lot of data, I can tell you. But um, still, visibility is something uh, to look at. So what I'll be doing in this talk is exploring exactly how these visibility patterns that we see in the Iron Age that might be important for structuring interactions uh, differ from the Republican period and throughout the Imperial Roman periods. And also, I think it's important to not only talk about the structure in these individual time slices, 
but also kind of hypothesize how this actually changed. How did you go from the Iron Age to the uh, Republican period, to the Imperial period? What was the logic when new sites emerged and how did that affect the st visual structuring of the surrounding landscape? Okay, so I'll be looking at the structure of these visibility networks throughout time and also the processes that gave rise to these different visibility networks. Hypothetically. <laughs> So why visibility? Um, I mean, obviously, what, what I'm doing here is, is going to be a, a quantitative approach. And there's a lot of issues that archaeologists have raised and non-archaeologists have raised with doing quantitative visibility uh, studies. I'm not going to address all of them here, but basically there's a lot of issues that we're confronted with. Stuff like past vegetation or atmospheric conditions or the fact that our uh, models of the landscape don't completely represent uh, the, the actual landscape in the past. And also that we're kind of overemphasizing uh, vision as one of the senses over the other senses. Um, and archaeologists have kind of confronted these kind of critiques uh, by adding um, a certain measure of uncertainty to their quantitative methods. So a lot of approaches like the Higuchi viewshed, which considers different uh, bands of distance away from the observer and interprets them in different ways, or the fuzzy if probable viewshed, which I will be uh, exploring here. Um, there are all ways of adding some sort of variability in the quantitative analysis. But at the very least, we should uh, kind of define what we mean with visibility before we start talking about how they could have structured interactions between people in the past. So, um, basically, I'll make three assumptions of what visibility means in this study. Uh, and we can discuss whether you agree with those or not at the, at the end, I'm sure. Uh, the presence as well as the absence of a line of sight from one urban settlement to another reflects the possibility that, on the one hand, this was intentional, and the possibility that it structured the surrounding space, and thirdly, a possibility that the way in which it structured space might reveal aspects of the roles ascribed to it in the past. And what I'm interested in is the different roles that visibility played in structuring interaction in the past. And if we want to understand those roles, we have to understand why sites emerged in certain locations. And to do that, we need to take not a static approach, we need to take a dynamic approach. An approach that actually models the process that leads to these patterns that we see. So, to do that, I will use data. On the one hand, if we want to do a quantitative approach of, uh, you know, of, of, of visibility in a landscape, we need uh, a model of the landscape. So we have a digital elevation model, um, which is interpolated from observations uh, and which uh, that interpolation has a 35 meter resolution and a root mean square error of uh, so, so the difference in the, um, between the observations and the interpolated model of the landscape that I used is 3.37 meters and that's important for a uh, next part of the, of the method and I use a single observation point per site now if you, you can see that this is just a density distribution of the number of sites uh, in the area, and you can see that there's a, a clear kind of overemphasis, or like there's just way more sites in the very fertile area, which known as the Vega and the Campinia, right here. Uh, significantly less sites along the Guadalquivir River itself, and also along the um, Lagos Ligustinus um, uh, inland sea here, and then obviously in the in the foothills. But that's kind of the edges of our uh, of our study area. Now, obviously this density, the site density pattern will significantly affect or will at the very least be one interpretation of the patterns we can expect. So we can, we can definitely expect uh, a denser a visibility network structure right here in the blacker areas and a much sparser structure around the edges of the study area and also in this area surrounding the, um, the Guadalquivir River. So we have to keep that in mind. There's a massive, massive bias though. Non there's one thing that has a very strong effect on the results we can expect, and that is the fact that I use only one observation, one observer per site. There, on the one hand, that's just kind of like a, a logistical decision. There's 190 sites. I need to analyze visibility for all of them. It's a lot of work, I can tell you that. But uh, it's also a very, a very conscious decision. So just imagine this example. We've got one observer here at the very center on the left-hand side. Uh, on a site called Carmona, which is very central and is located in a very visually prominent location. Um, 
I decided to put that person on uh, a very well-known feature of Carmona, the Roman gate, which was, I mean, you could argue that it was positioned there just because it could see in certain directions, or that visibility was good in certain directions. However, if on that same site, I put three observers, and obviously the, the, the gray area is the area in the surrounding landscape that can be seen, and the white area is what you can't see. So if we add two more observers, then the complete area that can be seen is significantly larger, even though the area where two or more um, observers can see, which is this area here, is, the, um, is exactly the same area as the one with a single observer. So there's just an incredible, uh, this has an incredible effect. And the reason why I chose to, to use only one uh, observer is just because we have no idea of the extent of the vast majority of these sites. For about, um, I think, 60% of these sites, the area is completely unknown. For another 20, we can guess the area. But even for those where we can guess the area, we just have no idea whether it extended um, you know, to the west of the point observation that I'm using or to the east. We just So putting extra observers per site would be a guesswork for at least 60% of sites. Well, then you could argue, well, there's a couple of sites where we do know the extent of the urban communities very well. Why don't we just add observers for those? Um, the reason for that is because they would very much, that would be a significant bias in the analysis itself. Those sites would be very much overemphasized. So just to kind of um, uh, prevent that question from appearing, that's why I only used one observer. Um, and it was already a, a lot of work, to be honest. So then uh, we, we kind of chop up this analysis in five time slices uh, using this chronology you can see right here, uh, going from the Iberian Late Iron Age all the way through the R Roman Republican and then three uh, imperial um, periods. And it's a little bit arbitrary and it's a little bit um, you know, easy to could just kind of chop it up. But as you could see from the number of sites that continue in occupation, this is a very persistent pattern. And our data of uh, the dating of the sites just doesn't allow us to uh, chop this up into much finer periods. And then there'll be uh, a couple of site attributes that I'll consider um, and, and their importance on creating these visibility patterns. On the one hand, I'll ask the question whether um, the, the fact that an urban uh, community has Iron Age origins, whether it was actually occupied in the Iron Age, uh, was important for creating the patterns that it has in Roman times. And on the other hand, those hypotheses that Roman archaeologists very often uh, use to talk about these particular sites, the urban status, the, whether they're municipia or colonia, and um, their location on road and river networks. Uh, so as I said, uh, the road network, the, the, the main one I use is the Via Augusta, which you can see in black on this map right here. I don't use uh, secondary roads or transhumanist roads because uh, their dating is just extremely problematic. And also the navigable rivers, which are indicated on, in a bluish color on this map. So the, the top one here is the Guadalquivir, and then this little one coming down here is the Ganil River. And this is um, what we think was uh, navigable in Roman times. So the location of these sites on those transport networks, does that explain the visibility patterns? Maybe it does. To analyze that, we need a method, a very formal method, so as I said, you can create visibility networks between uh, sites, uh, drawing arrows between them if a line of sight connects, a line of sight connects them. Um, I'll use an approach called a probable view shed, where I don't just calculate visibility from one uh, viewer observer location once. No, per site I do that 100 times. But every time I introduce a random error to the topography model. And the reason for that is to address a couple of biases. Firstly, that the topography model that I use is not an exact representation of the situation it was in the past. Uh, it's also not even an exact representation of what it is in the present, because I use an interpolation method. And we saw that the root mean square error of 3.37, I think, um, is, is an indication of how wrong my model of the landscape is. So we need to make up for that. So what I do is, every time, um, uh, every cell in the landscape can be increased or decreased by a value between plus 5 meters and minus 5 meters. 
that five meters, uh, so, so you'll basically get an effect of decreasing visibility uh, as you move away from the observer. And I do that for all 190 sites. And the advantage of doing that is not only do you just get like a really big network in the entire area that you can threshold on, for example, the distance of a line of sight, but you also have an indication of how probable, how many times out of 100 is a line of sight actually attested. And how many times out of 100 is that line of sight also reciprocated? Can observer B see observer A or see site A, right? So um, it just gives us a better indication of the most persistent patterns and structures within that landscape. Then, to talk about these processes, I'll use a method called exponential random graph models, which is very scary. It took me two months to understand what that actually means. And it just turns out it means exactly what it is. You just have to be able to define all those things. Uh, now, forget about definitions. I'll use an analogy that I use to explain it to myself when I forget what this actually means. And that's using Legos. So imagine you have this really big box of Legos um, that can create this really cool medieval castle that you've always wanted, but you don't have the step-by-step -step guide of how to create it anymore because your dog ate it or something, right? How do you go about this issue? How can you still get your amazing medieval castle? Well, you could do one of two things. On the one hand, you could just close your eyes, reach into the box, and grab two blocks of different shapes and sizes randomly and put them together in a random way. And then keep on doing that until there's no more Legos left in your box. Chances that you will get a castle are almost non-existent, okay? We could do this in a slightly smarter way. We could think about what a castle actually looks like and which kind of building blocks you would expect more often to be combined together within a castle and which two building blocks you would expect less often to appear together within a castle. And then you let that those assumptions that you make of how building blocks appear together, you let that influence your selection of those building blocks. So again, you go to your box, you take two building blocks affected by your, uh, your decisions affected by your assumptions, and you put them together. And then in the end, you might not end up with a medieval castle, but you might end up with something that actually looks like a medieval castle, or significantly more so than uh, the random method. Or at the very least, you know which assumptions made you uh, choose for that particular process? Which assumptions made you lead to that final observation, that possible castle you have in the end, right? So I like this analogy for explaining exponential random graph models. Think about a network. A network is basically uh, consist, consists of a number of different building blocks, individual nodes in isolation, for example. That's the smallest building block. But one node and one link. Uh, two nodes that are linked to each other. Or another building block could be two nodes that uh, are linked uh, in a reciprocal way. One tie is sent from A to B, and B sends that tie back. You could also have triangle shapes or, uh, or star shapes. So you can basically take an observed network, you can break it apart into all of these little Legos, into all of its individual building blocks, and then make assumptions of which building blocks uh, appear together more often. Which, um, which building blocks will give rise to other building blocks as well? What if you have an individual node? What is most likely to occur? If you have a reciprocation of line of sight, is it then more, uh, do you assume that it is more likely that there will be another site that joins and that reciprocates a link with the original site? Or um, does one site become more prominent visually than any other site? We can make assumptions like this. And when I was talking about our research questions, we actually do make assumptions about this. So, if we want to use exponential random graph models, we have to be extremely explicit about what kind of hypotheses we're trying to test, what kind of assumptions we make, and how we are going to represent that in a, in a, in a formal method. So the hypotheses that we are looking at here is a couple of, couple of things I could that you can imagine in a visibility network. Uh, on the one hand, if we consider communication or signaling to be important for this visibility network, using fire or smoke, then you would expect uh, intervisibility between these uh, urban communities, at the very least. Um, secondly, if you expect visual control over the surrounding landscape and surrounding communities to be important, then you would expect the site to have a lot of outgoing lines of sight. Otherwise, you can't control. And thirdly, 
If a site is purposefully or has a tendency towards being visually prominent, towards being seen, a good example of that might be uh, that site you have right there on the poster, which is Castillo de Muva, uh, ancient Munigua, which is really beautiful and is in the middle of the Sierra Morena. Um, uh, and it's, it's just really, really difficult to get there. It's very typical Spanish kind of signposting. You'll get a, you'll get a signpost like 50 kilometers before the site pointing you in the general direction and then, you, then the road stops and you have to go through a field full of bulls to take a picture like the one there. <laughs> All of that for digital classicist. Uh, no, it's, it's a site that you can see, for example, from a lot of other sites, but you might not necessarily be able to see from that site to a lot of other sites. So it's a visually prominent site. So you would expect a lot of incoming lines of sight, right? And then some sites might be purposefully or have a tendency towards being invisible. They might not want to, you know, people there might not want to be seen. So then you expect those to be isolated in a network. And we can also create a couple of hypotheses for evaluating whether those site attributes are important for explaining the visibility patterns that we see. So how important is the fact that a site has an urban status, the fact that a, a site is a colony, for example. Um, do colonies on average have a lot of outgoing lines, a lot of ingoing lines, or do colonies or other sites with an urban status tend to be intervisible with each other? We can test that, you know? Um, also, the same for um, sites on the transport network. Are sites along the rivers and along the road network mutually intervisible, or do they tend to dominate surrounding the landscape or not? And also what's very important is uh, the, the, the tendency uh, for sites with an Iron Age origin and Iron Age settlements that continue in occupation to either be very visually prominent or not, or to have a lot of uh, reciprocity with other sites that, um, were, that have Iron Age origins. And that allows us to test how dif different this actually is in Roman times compared to um, the Iron Age period. And if we make these kind of assumptions, if we make these kind of explicit hypotheses to test, then we can think of network building blocks that best represent these hypotheses. I mean, here, D, for example, this just represents an isolated site, a site that's invisible from, other sur from, from, from surrounding sites. A just represents two sites that are mutually intervisible. This could be an indication for a signaling network, might not be. Some people like to talk about those things. And B represents a, 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 a site with a high degree of visual control. One side at the center here. From that side, an observer can see three surrounding sites. C, on the other hand, is a visually prominent site because from three surrounding sites, site C can be seen. All right? So we make these kind of assumptions. We identify which building blocks we see more often together, or we expect to see more often together and which building blocks we expect to see less often together, and which building blocks we just don't care about, right? And we create models and we see what kind of results we get, and whether those results are plausible, given the observations that we made in the, in the field. Um, now, if you create networks, you get something like this. So this is basically um, a visibility network of this area uh, for all periods combined, and just restricted to uh, a distance of 20 kilometers away from an observer. So these are only the local patterns. And I look at these different bands of distance away from an observer because we have to interpret them in different ways. Um, what it means for two people, for example, let's say two urban communities to be intervisible over a distance of 20 kilometers or 50 kilometers, what you can distinguish at these distances will differ. So you have to kind of address them in a different way. You have to interpret them in a different way. Um, and these are just the most persistent patterns. So those in the probable view shed that had a, a probability of 50% or higher. So it's pretty fragmentary actually. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize that this is just like all periods combined. Uh, and then we, do, we can do the same, but uh, for a distance of 50 kilometers away from the observer and then we get something like this. And then something absolutely meaningless in my eyes, what if we don't consider any limit? What if you, you are Superman and you can see from one side of the study area to the other side of the study area? Well, then you get something like this. But this will, um, I just did this to be complete and because I had the data, but um, I'm not really gonna focus on this. So in general, we'll focus on those networks uh, that are either limited to 20 kilometers around the observer or 50 kilometers around the observer. 
and especially those uh, lines of sight that are most persistent that occur in 50% of the simulations or more. Okay, if we just analyze this kind of structure, then we see that there's a difference between uh, the structure of the 20 kilometer networks and the 50 kilometer networks. Um, I'll just very quickly go through this. Uh, the key clusters in the 20 kilometer networks are areas with a high density of sight. As I said, that's something we can expect because of the sight density. And many visually prominent sites occupy a key position in the networks or occupied in Iberian and Republican periods, but cease to be so in the imperial periods. So that suggests that, I mean, the structure suggests that there, on a local level, there's a difference between the Iron Age, Republican period, and the uh, Roman imperial periods. And then the 50 kilometer lines of sight, um, they have a significantly different role in structuring the cultural landscape than the shorter lines of sight. Uh, well, that doesn't really mean anything, really, does it? Uh, it's basically, we see, a, we see a different structure. We see hubs playing a different role, uh, different sites being hubs over the long distance than sites that have a lot of connections over, over a short distance. And we also see that the sites with an urban status are, don't tend to be very visually prominent. Now, the exponential random graph models, as I said, focus on the process, not just the structure. It allows us to think about how did this structure emerge? And how did it change through time? Um, on the one hand, we can make different levels of assumptions about how this structure emerges. And at the, very, at the most basic level, we can just make no assumption at all. And that means that we're modeling a random process. So we don't make any assumptions. We just say like, well, um, you, know, you have one node, then a second node emerges. That node connects with a probability of uh, you know, uh, between 0% and 100% randomly chosen uniform distribution, and that tie emerges or not. All right. uh, we can make models uh, to see how these random uh, processes could actually explain the observed networks. And it turns out that all the observed networks are actually significantly different from the randomly generated networks with the same number of nodes and arcs. Now, that's not very surprising, because obviously no social system, or no social system I know of, is emer uh, emerges through completely random processes. There's people involved here, you know. People, communities, like the, the, the decision to uh, start occupying a site or a, an urban environment in one place or another is an extremely complex decision. It's not just to do with the visibility and it's not devoid of human decision making at all. Right? So it's probably not uh, random, but as far as our archaeological data is concerned, as far as we know of those site location processes, uh, it might as well look random. So we kind of have to cancel out those random processes first before we continue making further assumptions. And that's exactly what I did. But it turns out that a couple of these uh, uh, networks, so the, the maximum values for the late imperial period limited to 20 kilometer uh, was not significantly different from the random, uh, randomly generated networks. So I think the late imperial period, our, our data, or at least the data we use in this project, it might actually not be uh, very representative for that period. Okay, so let's look at those models. So this is, uh, these are models for uh, uh, an area restricted to 20 kilometers around the observer. And it turns out that for all periods, from the Iron Age all the way through all the Roman periods, we see that there's a strong ten tendency towards intervisibility. But also, there's a difference between the early periods and the later periods. We see that in the Iberian, Republican, and early imperial times, uh, we have a tendency towards a lot of incoming lines, so sites being uh, visually prominent. But only in the Iron Age do we have a tendency towards the creation of many outgoing lines. So especially in the Iron Age, and to some degree in the first three periods, we see a tendency towards hubs for sites to be very visually prominent, but also visually controlling over the landscape. And we know that sites, um, or, or there's an indication that these sites don't just tend to be either visually prominent or you know, dominated the surrounding landscape, but in the Iron Age, they seem to combine those. So sites that are visually prominent also tend to, have, uh, tend to be good vantage points themselves. And then another difference between those periods is that for the Iron Age, there seems to be a negative tendency towards isolates. So a lot of sites are included within the visibility network. Most of the sites are actually visible from one place or another. In the imperial periods, though, there's a positive tendency towards isolates. So this suggests processes uh, where sites are located, or this, this might 
kind of help us interpret the importance of visibility for uh, site location, for determining site location, because there's a clear difference in whether sites are actually visible or not between the Iron Age and the Roman period in our models. Then, a couple of models for uh, the observations restricted to 50 kilometers. So these are longer distance uh, networks. And I must admit that these are actually, these were very hard to fit these models. And uh, the, the results aren't very encouraging. Um, emphasizing again the results from the exploratory network analysis that the 20 kilometer distance networks and the 50 kilometer distance networks need to uh, be addressed in different ways. They have different roles in structuring possible communications or interactions between these past communities. But again, we see a, a strong tendency towards a reciprocation of lines of sight um, throughout all periods. And again, for the first, for the, for the Iron Age, we see a tendency for sites to be visually prominent. But aside from that, I can't say anything interesting about the 50 kilometer networks. Now, to finish, um, what about those attributes? What about the importance of uh, sites being located along transport networks or sites uh, that have Iron Age origins or sites with an urban status? Do those attributes help us explain the visibility patterns or not? Um, I've only done this for the early imperial networks restricted to 20 kilometers. Early imperial because the, the, the data, the urban states in particular, and the road networks is, uh, is only relevant really for that uh, period. So it turns out that for all of these models, we have many more significant effects than without the attributes. We have without the attributes, which kind of gives an indication that the attributes actually do matter for explaining the visibility networks that we see. Um, there's one exception though. The transport network, so the rivers and the roads, doesn't really show any significant effects. So the transport networks don't really explain visibility very well, which is not very surprising because uh, especially sites located along a river, for example, um, I mean, you'd, you'd really have to kind of select the hills, which is sometimes done, by the way. Uh, but uh, you, you'd really have to select the hills and not the low-lying locations where the harbors might be located, for example, to have good vantage points over, uh, over a river. Um, but the other attributes are interesting. So we see especially the urban status and the Iron Age origins uh, model to have uh, one particular effect, an out to star effect. So there seems to be a tendency for sites with an urban status or sites that continue to be occupied throughout the Iron Age to, uh, to visually control the surrounding communities, uh, but in a different way. So this is only for the early imperial period, and we see a difference between the model that I discussed earlier for the Iberian period. They just, you can see that, I mean, this, this node there only has two outgoing lines. That's just an abstract representation. But in general, this suggests a tendency for sites to be less visually controlling than in the Iron Age, right? So there's, there's definitely a degree of uh, residue that we can see. These Iron Age sites continue to, to, to be hubs, but to a lesser degree than in the Iron Age itself. Uh, and, and also there seems to be some kind of correlation between uh, sites with an urban status uh, acting as visual hubs. But there's also a negative and significant two-path effect, which basically means that uh, these sites that are visually controlling don't tend to be visually prominent themselves. So if we take these attributes into account, the results of our, um, of our analysis changes. We can see that there is a clear difference between the processes that might have led to the Iron Age visibility networks and the processes that might have led to the Roman times uh, visibility networks. Just kind of suggesting that it's worth addressing these visibility networks. That we can't really ignore you know, this kind of residue pattern. That there is a possibility that not only it's still structured uh, possible interactions between communities in the past, but also that maybe there's an indication that it did, it did so in a very different way and then it was still taken into account. But these are, you know, the only thing these models can do is give kind of suggestions of um, what's more plausible than anything else. It's now time for the Roman archaeologists and the classicists to stand up and say what they make out of that, you know, maybe in the questions. So, to conclude, um, there seems to be throughout time a strong degree of continuity. So, intervisibility is common and uh, both short and long distance networks uh, tend to have a reciprocation of lines of sights. Also, the process, I mean, there's a suggestion that these processes that lead to the visibility networks are not random processes at all. But what are they? Well, they seem to be 
pretty different from the Iron Age to Roman times. In the Iron Age, there's a tendency towards hubs, a uh, strong importance of long distance lines of sight. This is actually something I found out from the exploratory network analysis and not from the models. And in the later, the Roman periods, there's a tendency towards, still towards some hubs, and that can be explained on the one hand through the residue pattern of the Iron Age sites, but also there's some kind of connection with sites with an urban status. Um, and also a tendency for uh, you know, a, a, a denser, shorter distance lines of sight. Uh, then some attributes were interesting, like the urban states and the Iron Age origins, but the transport network doesn't re really seem to explain this. So, the role of sites changes through time within this uh, network of visibility. And visibility patterns and site locations require different explanations in the Iron Age compared to Roman times. It kind of sounds like a very, you know, very, uh, very small result, but I think it's important. You know, I think, I think this is a good argument for saying like, listen, we've, you know, in one period, scholars in one period, Iron Age specialists focus on this, they think it's so important, and then Roman specialists just completely ignore that factor and start focusing on something else, for very good reasons, because we have other data, you know, other data require other explanations. But let's not forget that this pattern is still there and that it might still play a role. And I hope that I've identified some ways in which it might have played a role. So there is some future work to be done, quite a lot of it, but uh, if you have some money, I will do it for you. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. There's a lot of people I need to thank for this, but thank you for staying here. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Okay, I think that was um, yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, I wonder if you could just say a bit more about the kind of context of these visibility networks in terms of things that um, aren't to do with visibility, because I think you made a very compelling case for this kind of causal set of relationships about communication and transport, rivers, and roads, and so forth. But what about things like Proximity to water, mm. for example, or um, you know, political, military divisions, that yeah. sort of thing. I mean, how would you, how would you kind of marry your intervis intervisibility networks up into that sort of other kind of network that has nothing to do with visibility without yeah. become, without becoming an environmental determinist? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think there's two ways of doing this. The, the approach that I would take to not have to go away from visibility is to include it as an attribute. Some of these things can actually be done. But arguably, some things like distance from certain water sources, for example, can just be described with a very simple um, a mathematical model rather than using these stochastic models. Um, but if we forget about visibility, I mean, what I was not trying to do was to give an approach that says that site location can be completely explained through visibility networks. Sure. Obviously, there's other factors. This is an extremely complex, I mean, site location, uh, you know, decision to, to start an urban community somewhere and not in other places, an extremely complex social decision and is influenced by political decisions and everything. Um, I think uh, the only aim of this research really was to say we can't forget about visibility uh, and I'm not sure how this can actually be uh, directly combined with uh, other studies of site location that take, don't take visibility into account with others. So um, I, I don't think this research was really aimed to, uh, to be merged with those other approaches. Sure. I think only the results should be taken into account. I, yeah, I know. Thank you, Tom, very much for uh, yeah, very, very interesting and talks about them as well. I, I see you have given Leaf an acknowledgement on that. So yeah. just an, firstly an observation that uh, this would be good to, to factor in with his, his, his early work on transport vectors. And is, it, is it close by the same region? I just remember it being it's in southern Spain. Yeah. I don't remember exactly where. It's exactly the same region. And uh, same region. to be honest, um, Leaf's one of the reasons why I'm doing this. So uh, LEAF was also involved in the early stages of this urban connectivity project. LEAF was, uh, did his master's in Southampton, and that's when he did the transport vectors. He gave so, a very early talk for us in, it was right. in our first publication that was online. He I cite that all the time. <laughs> so we'll give that another plug when we have the camera rolling. But I'm, I'm just sort of formulating my, major, my main question, so I just want a little bit more information, the gentle one first. 
just to give you a little bit more background on it, um, two things I wasn't quite clear about on your lines of sight, why they are all not reciprocal, right? If one place can see another place, mm. why, if A can see B, why can't B see A? You see what I mean? If you can just give me a, a few obvious, that's probably something obvious I'm missing. The second bit was uh, when you have three observers in the same location, they could see considerably more than one. So I assume when you mean location, they're not in the same spot. One is that end of town, one is that end yeah, of town. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Mm. That's good. Got that. <laughs> but why, why can't, if, if A can see B, why can't we see A? Well, because um, we have to take into account a couple of the other lines that are mentioned here on this image. So in this case, A can see B and B can see A. But just imagine if this hill was slightly higher, right? Um, then it might, there, there are situations in which uh, an observer with a height which in my study was 1.7 meters, that's just another assumption, um, where this observer, observer B, can obviously see uh, the base here of observer A, but observer A oh, cannot see the base of observer B. Because I'm not assuming uh, that we're talking here about intervisibility of individuals, in which case I would go, you know, the observed location would be 1.7 meters high as well, and then re reciprocity should be enforced. But I'm, I'm talking about intervisibility between locations, but you can't do you know, location to location because visibility is always something that a human does, right? So you do have to simulate the fact that a human is standing in the landscape, looks around and sees um, a patch of terrain, not someone else's eyes, which is not distinguishable over 20 kilometers, I think. So, yeah, so in some cases that is, that is the case. And um, in particular, I mean, that effect becomes much stronger when you're taking this probable viewshed approach where uh, um, you know, some, some sites might seem to be intervisible over, you know, if you just do one run, but if you do a hundred runs with a different random error, it just turns out that consistently one arrow is more persistent than another one. So that's just an added advantage of being able to distinguish between these things. Because if you make assumptions about what it means to be visible and how that is different from being intervisible, then these kind of distinguishes do make a lot of, uh, make a lot of sense to include. That might, uh, 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 thank you, that, that clears it up for me, and, and, and that leads me, if it's okay, to, to the question. Now I've got it formulated in my head. Now I understand that. Um, with, with the lines of sight and thinking about space syntax and these type of techniques, you know, the of down the roads and stuff, the general principle, as I understand it, is that uh, there's a tendency for, for humans or whatever to, if you can see where you want to end up, you feel safe in walking. Mm. That's like, if you actually can't see mm. the place that you're actually aiming to go, it's, you have a tendency not to do that. Yeah. Right? Um, it's the approaches they use in modern architecture where you get a line that's like, if you're wanting to funnel pedestrian uh, movement through a space, you allow them to see where they're going to end up mm. and they head that way, right? rather than just randomly wandering around. So the, the difference between the, the 20 kilometers and the 50 kilometers we're getting up to I would imagine that the 20 kilometers ones would be far easier to actually get that line of sight that would encourage you to mm. walk to that place. Again, with the, the idea of how far can you walk or ride your pony or whatever it is you're doing in the course of the day. And I would imagine 50 kilometers was a little, I don't know, how far can you walk in a day? In the hot Spanish sun when you're resting, you know? Well, so my experience is, uh, is not the right one to refer to because it wasn't very much. Didn't, didn't Pliny say about his own villa that the good thing about it was it was 17 kilometres away, so it was yeah. a day's ride. Oh, yeah. I would say and that's why it was quite pleased with that one. Yeah. So I, I would imagine a scenario where you can sort of see one mm. place and that becomes a, a settlement because yeah. you, know, you can actually see it from your starting point, mm -hmm. that's where you end up, and then you've got the next, yeah. so you've got the 20 to another mm. one. So the yeah. 50 kilometres, I would expect to have an intermediate point between the starting point and the end point. I mean, the, the 20 kilometers is very often used as one of these bands of distance in visibility studies, but the reason is slightly more technical. It's because uh, I think that's the farthest away that you can actually um, distinguish uh, between, between a lot of these buildings and stuff. And then 50 kilometers, and, and you can clearly distinguish uh, certain signals like fire and smoke, for example, 
over 50 uh, kilometers. That's really the outer limits of when you can still see these kind of signals. Uh, but it, it becomes very difficult to actually still see uh, sites. Can you so, see semaphore at 20 kilometers? Can you see what? Semaphore, you know, the flag. Um, I don't think so, I don't think so, no. Because the, the, the guy who actually developed this approach for the first time is someone called Higuchi, and he t took, um, he considered more kind of uh, the, the angle of the viewer towards the horizon, and then how that angle changes uh, slightly as you come closer. And so there's a very wide angle uh, that just that's just concerned with, let's say, like, um, five kilometers away from the observer or something, and then the angle differences become very, very tiny. And he determined his, uh, his bands of distance based on whether you can still see a tree, whether you can distinguish um, a tree as a tree, or whether you can distinguish a leaf on a tree, for example. And the distance at which you could distinguish a leaf on a tree, which obviously differs on the region where you're looking, uh, would be the first band, and then the the, the, the distance with, between which where you could still identify a tree as a tree would be the second band, and the third band would be like tree equals forest. I can see there's a forest there, but I can't, can't see individual trees. Um, in, this, in this case, I tried that uh, first, but the 20 kilometer band basically is when you can still identify a forest as a forest. There's no talk about leaves or trees in this approach. I mean, it could actually be much more fine grained, but then your interpretation, I only kind of argument in doing that was that, you know, interpretation, as you suggest, should be different for these different bands, and they might mean something else. They might allow for different ways of structuring interactions. Anybody mm -hmm. else from the comment? Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask another question, which was about um, vegetation coverage, mm. uh, which obviously changes, yeah. particularly from the Iron Age the Roman period in some parts of Europe. I don't know particularly about Spain. But I mean, I just think of some um, intervisibility work that was done a while ago um, around Kilmartin Glen in Scotland, where they essentially compared the locations of rock art to uh, the pollen record for the vegetation history and found that the uh, lines of sight would have been very significantly different um, in the, well, much further back than what you were yeah. talking about. Yeah. I just wondered if there's any way you could you could factor you know possible changes in tree coverage and so forth into this, which yeah. would which would affect. No, uh, yes, you can. That's the short answer. Okay. <laughs> um, there's there's answer. kind of two ways of, uh, of of dealing with it. On the one hand, if you've got good information of what kind of vegetation you had, like using the pollen record, but maybe also which areas of the landscape actually had certain types of trees mm -hmm. and other vegetation, um, you could model that explicitly. Uh, and then it's, it's, it's pretty deterministic and you could add some, some degree of variability in that. Uh, Marcus Yobera has, uh, has published a paper on exactly that kind of approach. Um, an alternative is, approach is to accept that we have no idea. I mean, we have an idea of the type of vegetation which was possible in a certain period in this area, uh, but we have no idea where they were located. So uh, then you just, have a, you just take a general approach, like a fuzzy or a probable fusion mm -hmm. approach, where you introduce the random error, as I said. Yeah. And the reason why I chose a five meter random error, uh, so I increase the cell, a cell with a random probability uh, um, and a uniform distribution with plus five or minus five meters, is uh, it's, it's slightly higher than the root mean square error, which, which means that I um, include more variability than just to make up for the errors in me creating the topography model. And I think adding that extra variability makes mm -hmm. up for things that I can't uh, make up for otherwise. Atmospheric conditions, and just the mm -hmm. fact that it might have been foggy when that person was looking. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, tree, or trees you know, standing right in front of you, or vegetation. And why I think that's a valid approach is because the effect you would expect from vegetation um, is exactly the same effect that you get with the probable view shift. Sure. You get a decreasing probability of visibility as you move away from the observer. And that's to be expected. If a tree stands right in front of you, then the effect on the line of sight will be significantly uh, stronger than if a tree stands very far away from you. And that's exactly the kind of pattern that you see if you do this. So I, to address that, I increased the, uh, the, the random uh, aspect in the probable view shift to five meters.